It was a total accident, honestly. Uh, I was a practicing chiropractor. I I do a lot of little side things. You know, I like to keep myself busy. So uh, the first house Melissa and I bought, we were going to like remodel it, flip it and sell it. This was um, sort of right before the housing crash in 2008. So we had bought this house. I was working during the day as a chiropractor and I was basically remodeling this house like nights and weekends. And uh, I was putting a new roof on the house and I herniated a disc in my back um, on the roof. As a chiropractor, my wife's a chiropractor, you know, she, we knew what to do. I mean, it's what we do every day. And so she was treating me and, you know, for the most part, the, the back issues, a lot of the issues associated with the herniation, they got better within a couple of weeks, but the, the herniation was significant and I ended up with nerve damage and I had um, dro- what's called drop foot, but basically it's like a, a neuropathy in my right leg that affected the, the function of my right foot. And, you know, I was 25, I think at the time. And I was like, I thought I knew, I'll be honest, I kind of thought I knew everything. You know, I, I certainly knew how to help people. I knew how to help people with disc herniations. My background was exercise physiology before that. I've done a ton of work in clinical nutrition and movement patterns. So, you know, I thought that if I moved properly, if I exercised properly, if I rehabbed properly, if I got the right treatment, ate the right foods, kept my inflammation under control, like if I did all the things I tell everybody else to do, like this nerve should get better. And a year and a half later, I had no improvement in that nerve. And so I started to just think that like, that was, that was my life. Hey, welcome back to Normalize the Conversation. Today, I'm here with Dr. Jason Soners. Fascinated with human biology and performance, Dr. Jason Soners is always working to integrate new knowledge and practical experience. In addition to his Doctor of Chiropractic, he earned his Diplomate of the Chiropractic Board of Clinical Nutrition and his Diplomate of the International Board of Applied Kinesiology. He is currently earning his PhD in Molecular Biology with a concentration in Regenerative Medicine at the University of Miami School of Medicine. He published an Amazon best-selling book in 2020, Oxygen Under Pressure, describing the science and benefits of using hyperbarics for a variety of indications, longevity, and performance enhancements. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you really? Uh, ah, I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm um, happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You know, uh, pretty much any, any time, you know, somebody you know, has a platform like this and we can share some information that might help somebody out there that's looking for solutions to whatever issues might ail them, you know, I'm always happy to participate. So I really appreciate the invite. Of course, I'm really excited for this conversation on hyperbaric medicine. Recently in the mental health field, I've started to see a lot of movement on hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a treatment, but there's a lot of mixed reviews out there on whether or not it works. So I'm looking forward to having you share the science behind it and debunk a lot of those myths that are out there. So to start, for those who don't know, what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Yeah, so um, there are, just to, just to double back on that statement, there are so many myths and misconceptions about hyperbaric. Uh, Pretty much the main reason that Melissa and I run around doing so much talking about it is, you know, I think that, I think that ultimately it's very underutilized. This is a, this is a therapy that's very safe and we'll talk about, you know, the, how it works and the, and the safety behind it all, but it's a very safe therapy. It has an enormous effect on so many people but it's underutilized. And I think the main reason that it's underutilized is because there's so many myths and misconceptions that surround it. And so conversations like this, normalizing it, uh, conversations like this help so much, I think, just, you know, get everybody on the same page with regard to, you know, some of the basics. So, I mean, hyperbaric literally means hyper means increased, baric means pressure. And so really what we're doing is we're going into a, a hyperbaric chamber, a vessel, and we're pressurizing that vessel. Everybody, for the most part, has been in a pressurized vessel before. An airplane is a pressurized vessel. So just the way a cabin needs to be pressurized, you feel some ears, you know, pressure in your ears. You have to clear your ears while you're flying, when, especially when you're landing. You know, that's a, that's a pressurized vessel. But in, in those cases, what they're doing is you're going up in altitude, and ultimately, we can't breathe. So if you're flying in an airplane at 35,000 feet, and the airplane wasn't pressurized, there wouldn't be enough oxygen pressure for you to breathe. So they pressurize the cabin to create an artificially 
uh, higher oxygen pressure environment so that you could be at a really high altitude and still be able to survive the flight. What we're doing with hyperbaric is we're starting at sea level and then we're pressurizing that vessel. And so in an airplane, maybe you're flying, let's say at 40,000 feet and you're pressurizing the vessel to mimic roughly the equivalent of like 8,000 feet uh, above sea level. What we're doing here is we're starting at sea level and we're pressurizing the vessel to, uh, to mimic below sea level pressures. And really the, the, the summary of all of that is that pressure is the reason even right now that when you breathe, you absorb oxygen. There's a, there's a pressure of our atmosphere and that pressure, when we breathe oxygen in, that pressure allows the driving force of oxygen to go into your circulation. At sea level, I live at sea level, at sea level, there's just the right amount of pressure to saturate my red blood cells about 100%. In Denver, like if you lived in altitude, there's less pressure. And so because there's less pressure, we don't saturate as well. And our bodies try to adapt to that. The way they adapt to that is by increasing the amount of red blood cells that we have in our body. When we go below sea level, we can certainly still saturate our red blood cells, but we can go even a step further. And now we can start super saturating our blood. And that's really what hyperbaric is about. It's about taking somebody, certainly making sure that they're getting all the oxygen they need, typically in their red blood cell saturation. But then we're creating a surplus of extra oxygen that we don't normally have access to. And it's really that extra oxygen that is the turning point for many of the reasons that hyperbaric helps people. It's the turning point to jumpstart, you know, healing, energy production, uh, recovery, regeneration of tissue. All the things that we hear about hyperbaric has to do with this surplus of oxygen that we're now creating inside the body. First of all, I love how you explain um, explained it by comparing it to like an airplane because I think the like hyperbaric and chamber is kind of like terrifying because you don't really know what those mean those are just kind of words that seem overwhelming and you put them together and people are like well that can't possibly work that can't be good that's not normal we don't usually go into chambers we don't go in hyperbaric chambers but by debunking that right away and explaining that it is something you've gone through you've been in you've survived it's the same thing, but now we're adding extra oxygen to help you to provide that support that you need. So how long have you been working with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and what inspired you to get into it? So it was a total accident, honestly. Uh, I was a practicing chiropractor. I, I do a lot of little side things. You know, I like to keep myself busy. So uh, the first house Melissa and I bought, we were going to like remodel it, flip it and sell it. This was... Um, sort of right before the housing crash in 2008. So we had bought this house. I was working during the day as a chiropractor and I was basically remodeling this house like nights and weekends. And uh, I was putting a new roof on the house and I herniated a disc in my back um, on the roof. As a chiropractor, my wife's a chiropractor, you know, she, we knew what to do. I mean, it's what we do every day. And so she was treating me and, you know, for the most part, the, the back issues a lot of the issues associated with the herniation, they got better within a couple of weeks, but the, the herniation was significant and I ended up with nerve damage and I had um, dro what's called drop foot, but basically it's like a, uh, a neuropathy in my right leg that affected the, the function of my right foot. And, you know, I was 25, I think at the time. And I was like, I thought I knew I'll be honest, I kind of thought I knew everything, you know, I, I certainly knew how to help people. I knew how to help people with disc herniations. My background was exercise physiology before that. I've done a ton of work in clinical nutrition and movement patterns. So, you know, I thought that if I moved properly, if I exercised properly, if I rehabbed properly, if I got the right treatment, ate the right foods, kept my inflammation under control, like if I did all the things I tell everybody else to do, like this nerve should get better. And a year and a half later, I had no improvement in that nerve. And so I started to just think that like, that was, that was my life. And uh, I was at a show, it was a chiropractic show um, in Las Vegas. So like a big conference center with a huge vendor hall. And there was a guy there with these chambers. I had no clue what they were. This is about 14 years ago. Okay. So I had no idea what they were, what they did. It just looked cool. And they were doing like sample sessions. So I was like, I want to get, I want to go in this tube. What is this thing? 
And so, you know, I did about a 30 minute session. I climb out, didn't think anything of it, just seemed interesting. But as I'm walking around the vendor hall, looking at other, other products and things that were, were being displayed, I started to get like a, you know, that pins and needles feeling. So I started to get that in my foot. And that was the first time I had literally felt my foot in like 18 months. And so all of a sudden I was like, wait, why is that? Is that happening because of that thing I just did? Like, I didn't even make those connections yet. So I went back and I spoke to the guy. And of course he was like, oh yeah, of course. Well, that's, you know, that's what this thing does. It heals nerves. And I was like, yeah, right. You're just trying to sell me this thing, right? I'm a little skeptical, but um, so he agreed. So I ended up doing about, uh, about eight hours worth of sessions over four days. And I left that place with like 15% improvement in my foot. And that was literally the first time it changed in all that time. And so needless to say, I was like, I don't know what this thing does. I have no idea how it works, but like it's doing something to my foot. I wanted my foot back in the worst way. So I bought one, brought it home, treated myself. And within a few weeks, basically I, I had full recovery of my foot. And so, you know, that was an, a, like a pivotal moment because I did think I knew a lot of stuff to help people like me. And while I did everything I knew to do, you know, I accidentally stumble on this tool that, you know, after a year and a half, nothing changed. And then all of a sudden in three weeks, I had my whole foot back. So um, that led me down a road of trying to understand the science better, because I guess it, I was happy that I, I was getting function back, but I started getting really upset because, you know, I go out of my way to learn as much as I can about so many different things. And through that whole journey in education, not one time did somebody say, hey, have you thought about hyperbaric? And, and I thought, but this thing was so effective and it helped me so quickly. Why is that not part of a conversation that people are having? And that's, that really, I mean, that was from there, it kind of grew exponentially. I don't know how much detail you want and all that, but, you know, getting into the research and then really understanding what it helped with and then bringing it. I had no intention when I bought it that I was going to use it on patients, but we certainly brought it into our clinic. We started treating patients. And then, you know, from there, it really just continued to, uh, to grow. That is absolutely amazing. I love how it was so accidental. It's kind yeah. of like fate, like you were meant to discover it. But can you, I love science. I love learning the science behind everything. So would you mind talking a little bit more about the science of how it helped your foot and what changed with those pins and needles, why it caused that feeling and how over time it was actually able to allow you to feel your foot again and use it and kind of just fix that nerve issue you were having? Yeah. So I'll go back a little bit what we were, we started talking about in terms of like the whole pressure gradient, but ultimately, um, like I said, so we're surrounded by an atmosphere, that atmosphere has a pressure and that pressure is what is allowing you and I to absorb oxygen, even in this moment, all the oxygen that your body gets delivered is currently bound to a red blood cell. Meaning in order for it to go from your lungs to your finger, right? It goes into your lungs, into your circulation, a red blood cell has to grab it and then ultimately deliver it wherever it's going to go. And then it releases it picks up carbon dioxide, that comes back to your lungs, you exhale that to get rid of it, you inhale the next round of oxygen, and then you go deliver the next round, right? I mean, it's not that simple, but you know what I mean? So, um, so what's happening is, especially when you have any type of circulatory damage. So in a disc herniation, there's a lot of inflammation, you break some blood vessels, the blood vessels are feeding the nerve. And when you um, when you look at a capillary, a capillary is where gas exchange happens. That's like the smallest little blood vessels that we have. So wherever gas exchange is occurring, red blood cells literally have to line up single file. It's a super thin vessel. And that's what allows that gas exchange, the carbon dioxide and oxygen to go back and forth. And so if you have a damaged blood vessel, you know, that's like a blockage all of a sudden. Now those red blood cells can't get on the other side of that blockage. So if there's a blockage there, whatever's, you know, whatever's over here is going to get oxygen. Whatever's on this side of that blockage is now considered hypoxic. It can't heal because it can't get oxygen. And it can't get oxygen because red blood cells can't get through because there's damage to the vessel. What's happening with hyperbaric is that you're, you're, you're bypassing red blood cells completely. You're dissolving oxygen instead of being carried by red blood cells. It's literally being dissolved in the liquid of your blood. And because it's delivered and 
dissolved in the liquid of your blood, even though the red blood cells can't get by, the liquid could just go everywhere. Nothing's blocking the liquid. So all of a sudden, uh, the red blood cells might be building up, but the liquid is still going. Now that the liquid has oxygen in it, this liquid is now able to feed that tissue and actually start stimulating the healing response. And so in most situations of chronic illness, what what's lost is what's called the oxygen gradient, the ability of oxygen on one side of a membrane to get to the other side of that membrane. And so the, 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 the two main things that hyperbaric is doing, one is it's dissolving oxygen in the liquid, meaning it can now flow everywhere that it needs to go. And two, it's increasing the gradient, making, a, making the pressure of oxygen in your blood higher than usual. And that is the driving force. The pressure is ultimately the driving force to get it into your cells. So as the pressure increases and the oxygen percentage increases, and now it's all being dissolved in your blood, and that's going literally everywhere throughout your whole body, every cell in your body is now able to uptake a higher percentage of oxygen than normal. That is so cool. I love how it kind of solves the problem of inflammation where your red blood cells can't get through, where you can't heal. You can't even begin to really heal and to be able to just get that oxygen through anyways. That's incredible. So yeah. now going from physical health to brain health, I think a lot of people have heard about it for a traumatic brain injury, which kind of makes sense when you're talking about inflammation. However, it really extends well into multiple mental health conditions as well. So what are some of the mental health conditions that HBOT can potentially, potentially treat? Sure. So one of the, even today, so 14 years ago when I got into this, the amount of research on most of these topics was, you know, like, maybe this month <laughs> today, maybe it's like, you know, but there, we still have an enormous way to go. You know, that's, that's actually the reason I started this PhD program was I wanted a, I wanted an outlet or a way a mechanism that I can actually start doing some of this research to contribute to this, this lack of research in some of these areas. Um, what I would say is that in the last 10 years, but primarily in the last like three or two or three, really, um, our awareness, especially in things like mental health, really has skyrocketed. Um, there's a few different mechanisms. So one is that because we don't have as much research in a lot of these topics as we need, what we really have to understand are mechanisms of action. In other words, a human goes inside this chamber, they get this extra oxygen that I'm talking about, regardless of what's either right or wrong with that person, what are the things, what are the cascade of events that go on inside that person's body because they were exposed to this oxygen? And there's a whole list. It's a pretty long list. But on that are things like, uh, on the physical healing, like we talked about, but, you know, collagen and fibroblast formation, uh, stem cells. So literally like rebuilding tissue, soft tissue, muscles, nerves, um, bone, even skin. Separate from that, there's a whole uh, chemical cascade that has an effect on um, neurotransmitters, hormones. Um, and so there's a few pieces to mental health component of this. One is that um, certain physical issues, whether that's food related or gut related, there's a lot of chemistry in our body that is always sending signals to our brain. So this, this connection between our body and our brain um, is vast and also not well understood even at this time. I would even say that five years ago, people would have thought it was controversial that I was even saying that there's this strong connection between the body and the brain. Meanwhile, you know, we, we clearly know that that's true. The reason to bring that up is that when the body is releasing certain chemistry of inflammation, it's going to send those same chemicals to our brain so that our brain understands the messages that the body is trying to send. So as a great example, um, even in our clinic, we do a lot of work with, let's say, food and supplements and different things to help gut health, because we know that there's a really strong connection between poor gut health and um, people who struggle with varying types of mental health. Um, and a lot of that has to do with helping the chemistry of neurotransmitters and hormones and the like. So, um, and hyperbaric would be, would be a big piece of that puzzle as well. So uh, also 
you could have trauma, like you brought up TBI. I think a lot of people have a, a past history, even if it's just mild or moderate concussions or you know other TBI events that you sort of just brushed them off. They weren't, it wasn't like you lost consciousness for 25 minutes or something. You weren't in a coma in the hospital. You know, you just got a good whack to the head. It hurt and you moved on. And you get a couple of those throughout the course of your life that could be very consequential later on and have enormous effects on our ability to manage, manipulate, build, create, and balance all the neurotransmitters inside of our brain. So I think even in cases where it's not a direct TBI cause, that a potential even mild history of concussion could be an underlying factor to other people's uh, mental health challenges that are that are being missed. There's a guy, uh, there's a doctor, Dr. Amen. Are you familiar with any of his work? I love his uh, research. Yeah. I mean, he's an amazing, amazing man. And, um, you know, he, he would probably be the first, you know, I mean, he is, I mean, when he would get up and say something like, you know, as a doctor, like we're the only doctors that don't actually inspect the organ that we're even, we're trying to treat. In other words, you know, we have all these medications and different strategies for dealing with mental health, and we're not even properly imaging the organ, the brain, to understand the condition that it's in, you know, so he does a lot of work with spec scans and, um, and tools like this, so that you can understand brain metabolism, because brain metabolism would shed enormous light on which parts of the brain are active, which parts of the brain are, are functioning normally, which parts of the brain are dormant or literally like shut down. And so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work now being done with, as an example, what role does hyperbaric play in improving these spec scans? Because if we can improve brain metabolism, if there's an area of inflammation in the brain or an area of dormancy in the brain, uh, and then that, that tissue is not being perfused properly, and that could be from addiction, that could be from trauma, that could be from inflammatory issues, all kinds of different things. If, they're not, if it's not metabolizing properly, we can't possibly expect it to function normally. And as we hyper perfuse, as we deliver higher levels of oxygen to the brain, and it's not like we can direct it. I can't say like, okay, well, when you go in the chamber, we're going to put it in your elbow. And when I go in the chamber, we're going to put it in my brain. You breathe it, it goes into your circulation and it, and it just goes everywhere, you know, anywhere your body might need, need that extra oxygen. So as we, as we increase the perfusion of the brain, we start to see improved brain metabolism. And we start to see areas of hyperactivity in the brain start to decrease and normalize. We see areas of hypoactivity in the brain start to increase their activity and normalize. And ultimately, we're not trying to, unlike medication, where we're trying to like have a very specific effect on a particular neurotransmitter or receptor, we're really just trying to give the body the ingredients that it already needed in the right amounts to get the brain or whatever body part we're talking about to just start to behave more optimally or more normally so that we get the, the tissue response that we're all really looking for. So hyperbaric's got an effect on the inflammation for sure, like you said, and that's very well researched in terms of different inflammatory markers, different cytokines, and the ability for hyperbaric to reduce the chemicals our body makes that are inflammatory, but also increase the chemicals that our body makes that are naturally anti-inflammatory. So it really helps to create balance there. But now there's more research coming out in the balance of the neurotransmitters, the balance of the hormones, and 100%, there's a lot of great studies now on the normalization of brain metabolism as seen through things like spec scans. And Dr. Amen, you know, should get a lot of credit. He's, he's done a lot of that work. He has. And I love going back to um, traumatic brain injury and just brain injury in general. It is so true. Most of us will have some kind of concussion whether it's a really small, mild one or a more severe one. I was a competitive cheerleader. I had 11 concussions within one year between car accidents and face planning and stunts falling on me all the time. And we don't realize how much damage that can do. We kind of look at the short-term effect where it was like, I was very groggy. I couldn't pass a word problem math test. Only time in my life I ever failed a math test. and like we look at that short term and then we get through that and we're like, okay, well, it's fine. It doesn't have any kind of actual long-term effect, right. but it does. And to know that there are actual 
things out there other than just medication. That's kind of a guessing game. And although I am very pro medication for mental health when it is right for the person, 100%. I love that there's more natural options that actually fix the root cause of the problem and does it kind of just cover up as a band-aid. So I yeah. think that's absolutely amazing. But one thing I've seen is kind of questions people ask is, does breathing an oxygen mask have the same effect? I know that it doesn't, but why does it not have that same effect? That's a great question. So, and I get that question a lot because ultimately um, from, a, from a practicality standpoint or a cost standpoint, or just like ease of access standpoint, if you could just get some sort of oxygen generation and a mask and just breathe on that, and avoid all these other conversations like that would be easier it would be faster it would be cheaper and you know um what i would say is that breathing so we we always re refer it's like scuba talk right but we always say like we're at the surface right now so breathing 100 percent oxygen at the surface through a mask would increase the pressure of oxygen inside your body however we are governed by the pressure that is surrounding us. And so, you know, if you were 98% saturated right now with oxygen, roughly, and you had 100% oxygen in a mask, like you can get two or 3% more, you know, that would be about the most you can, you can really think that you're going to get. Um, there are some therapies that, that include, you know, using increased oxygen on the surface with exercise, because what that does is it helps you metabolize the oxygen faster. So now you're creating what's called oxygen debt. And now you're breathing high oxygen while you're using up more oxygen. Now you can create like a, it's like a siphon, like you can pull more oxygen into your system at the surface doing things like that, but it still doesn't create that same reservoir. And so the, the difference between let's say it's called EWAT, what I was describing, exercise with oxygen therapy. So like exercising with oxygen or just breathing oxygen at the surface versus going into a chamber, the amount of oxygen that you really absorb is relative to the pressure that you're exposed to while you're breathing the oxygen. It's basically like a bottle of seltzer, if you will. Um, with seltzer, you're using a gas, carbon dioxide, you're using a liquid water, you're pressurizing the carbon dioxide and you're holding it next to a liquid. And what that does is it dissolves bubbles into the liquid and then you put a cap on. It. That's like a hyperbaric chamber, <laughs> okay? And it's, it's a gas and it's dissolved in a liquid. And if you were to look at that on a shelf and you didn't have a label on the bottle, you might not know that and you couldn't touch it you might not notice the difference between that bottle and a bottle of water. In other words, all the bubbles are in the liquid. You don't see them. If you squeeze the bottle, you would notice that it's much firmer than a normal bottle of water. But what would really happen is when you open it, all those bubbles start coming out of solution, right? So when you go inside of a chamber, we're using a gas. We're not using carbon dioxide. We're using oxygen. And we're using a liquid. We're not using water. We're using your blood. But ultimately, we're doing that same thing. You're inside the seltzer bottle <laughs> and you're being exposed to this increased pressure of oxygen. And now that oxygen is literally being dissolved in your blood, just like that bottle of seltzer. And the amount of oxygen that you can hold in your body in that environment is literally exponentially higher than any other thing that you can think of to do to get more oxygen. And as long as you're inside that chamber, you're just literally filling up with oxygen. And then when you get out of the chamber, just like when you open the bottle of seltzer, those bubbles start trying to come out. But when those bubbles are coming out, when they're oxygen bubbles and they're in your body, and now they're trying to come out of cir uh, circulation, basically, they don't just like bubble into the atmosphere. They literally interact with your entire body. So all of a sudden you're just becoming internally flooded with oxygen. So people think the treatment is all about being in the chamber. I would say half of the treatment is your time in the chamber. And the other half of the treatment is when you get out 
And now all this oxygen is trying to get out of your body. And as it's getting out of your body, it's interacting with your cells. So imagine, you know, while you're in the chamber, there's all this extra oxygen, but it's all in the tubes. When you get out of the chamber, now it's trying to get out of the tubes, <laughs> right? And it's just literally like, you know, it's flooding all of your cells with a tremendous amount of oxygen. So somewhere, it depends on how much pressure you're using, how much oxygen you're using, but literally on the low end, instead of like two or 3%, on the low end, you could be getting 60 to 90% more oxygen. On the high end, you could be getting literally 20 times more oxygen from hyperbaric than what you and I are getting right now. And to date, there's just no other tool that can deliver oxygen at that level besides hyperbaric because of those mechanisms. That is really cool. I like how it's not the whole treatment isn't really just being inside the chamber. It's afterwards that it continues to have effect on you yeah, and that it continues to kind of treat you as you continue on your day. So originally you spoke about your story and how in one session you started to feel different afterwards, but you did it for a few weeks before you finally got that full effect. Is it always something that takes multiple sessions? Is it something that sometimes there is a one session? Is it something that you have to do kind of frequently for the rest of your life? How does it really work? So it's good. Um... It varies tremendously based on basically like what's wrong, how severe is it, how long have you had it, like what the goals are in terms of treatment. So what I would say is that most people using it for, especially for chronic issues, you know, like think about it like this. Um, Hyperbaric is pretty well known to be used in a hospital for certain things like wound care or uh, radiation burns or certain infections like osteonecrosis or necrotizing fasciitis. Like really, these are literally, these are either life-threatening illnesses or limb-threatening illnesses. Like we're going to die in a matter of hours or days, or we're going to have an amputation very quickly. And as a last resort, they use hyperbaric oxygen. And in the overwhelming majority of those cases, it actually works. So it's like life or death, or you're going to lose a limb. You use pressurized oxygen as literally the last thing before we cut off a limb or that you die. And somehow that magically helps these people dramatically. So one issue I have is like, why are we waiting so long? <laughs> Maybe we should introduce that a little sooner for these people and, and have a better outcome. But more importantly, what I would say is you need a lot of pressure and a very high percentage of oxygen and you have to be very aggressive. Those people might do two, three, four sessions a day for three or four days in order to change what the physiology inside their body. For people that are not life and death or you know, life and limb, literally, the things that we use hyperbaric for, which are much more chronic issues, you know, people are often, they have these issues for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, they're not as intense but they certainly have enormous effects on our quality of life. And it's like, either they get a little bit worse over time or they're just stagnant, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a level of dysfunction over a long period of time. You know, we probably don't need to be that aggressive. We're not going to do three, four times a day, but we certainly might do three or four times a week. Right. In some cases, maybe two or three times a week. Um, and often it's not for five or six days. It's, a couple times a week, but it's for months because really the effect that we're trying to have is in normalizing and balancing, uh, you know, the person's physiology. Um, when you've had the condition for months and years, your, your body's set point, your, your body's, you know, understanding of homeostasis is skewed. And so it's really, it's really a smaller dose over a much longer period of time that gets bodies to start to stabilize and understand like that, that response. So ultimately, I'd say the overwhelming majority of, of patients in our office, depending again on what they're coming in for, you know, 10, 10 hours would be a very like low protocol, I would say. Most people do somewhere between 20 to 40 hours worth of care over somewhere between, you know, six to 10 weeks, varying 
frequencies and durations, again, based on sort of severity of what they're experiencing, but very few people, you know, there, there are short-term benefits like a little blast of oxygen, pretty much any cell will start making more energy. A any cell will start reducing some percentage of the inflammation that it's dealing with. Uh, your immune system will get a boost pretty quickly. So there's, there are certain changes that literally every hour someone's exposed, there's benefit. But the real changes when we're talking about either on the physical side with, you know, collagen, fibroblast, stem cells, like that kind of stuff, or in the mental health where we're talking about, you know, rebuilding all the microcirculation that was damaged through the concussion or the TBI or changing brain metabolism or, you know, changing neurotransmitter balance. This is something that takes, you know, weeks and months, not hours and days. So most protocols are sort of spread out over that period of time. That makes sense. I think a lot of us are always looking for that one time quick fix. And yeah. that's where the problem is, is that we're not really always committed to the treatment. And I love how you brought up that we tend to be so reactive. We wait to the last minute to give someone something that can help them instead of being proactive or preventative in so many ways with our healthcare. I know you have to go. So I want to just thank you again so much for joining me for this conversation. How can people connect with you to learn more about you, your practice and hyperbaric medicine? Sure. Yeah. Um, probably the fastest, easiest is um, the main HBOT USA website, which is literally hbotusa.com. Um, you know, from there, we've, we have a lot of education on that site. Um, we have a blog on that site that we update pretty regularly. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's also HBOT USA. I think I have like 120 videos on various topics of research-based, you know, does hyperbaric work for X, Y, and Z. Uh, some of the lectures that I've given, we've recorded and uploaded there as well. So uh, I'd say between hbotusa.com, the YouTube channel, there's, there's a there's a lot to get through right there. Um, uh, I've gotten good feedback on that book. So, you know, Oxygen Under Pressure came out about two years ago. It's on Amazon. Um, but that's like an easy enough read for most people to get through. It does go through the science and it goes through, you know, kind of the mechanisms of how hyperbaric works. And then it goes into some of the more, more common uh, issues that we use hyperbaric for, let's say, in our clinics. Uh, and then our local clinics are, you know, New Jersey HBOT and uh, Pennsylvania HBOT, like you said. Um, and, you know, people could look those up, find those pretty quickly if, if they wanted to. Uh, through the website itself, hbotusa.com, uh, there's some sort of contact us kind of page. People send me emails through there all the time. I'm happy to field them. Um, anything we can do to kind of improve the awareness and improve the likelihood that a person who needs hyperbaric can actually find it and find the right place to go you know, that's part of our mission. We're happy to help people go through that process. You are absolutely amazing. Thank you again so much. Oh my God. Thank me. you so much.